If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes, or you can look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It will contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have questions during the live webinar, you may type them in your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you're watching a recording of this webinar, you may email questions to the presenter at info, I-N-F-O, at johnson-center.org. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I want to thank you all for joining me today for our discussion on ways to help your family be more organized. It's a fact of life that kids come with stuff, and as they get older and their needs change, that often typically means more paper, more communication, more records. My goal here today is to help you think about some simple ways you can make your life easier by getting organized and making some of your information work for you. So my name is Anissa, and I'm the director here at the Johnson Center, but I'm also a mother, a zookeeper, a chauffeur, a personal assistant, a bookkeeper, a chef, a social calendar coordinator, a maintenance supervisor, an education and therapy consultant, um, a housekeeper. I would imagine that job likely sounds pretty familiar to most of you, and that's why you're joining us today. I made a New Year's resolution this year uh, to get organized again. It generally takes an event for me to kind of catch up and go through everything. And so doing this webinar has helped me think about the things I need to do to catch up or reorganize. And I want to share some of that with you so that we can go on this journey together. So let's go ahead and dive in. So parenthood is a lot like herding cats. Most of you have probably heard that saying, herding cats, but you tell your kids to do this and they do that, or you ask them to come here and they go there. You want this, they want that. You're late, they want to take their time. You want to find an important document. They want to give your dog a bath in the toilet. It can all just be a little bit overwhelming at times. But I want to tell you that I do know one thing. You've got this. And today we're going to talk about some tips and strategies that will help you accomplish the impossible, getting organized and getting all of those cats in a row. So where do we start? I think it's really important to acknowledge that this will be different for everyone. There's no one size fits all approach because there's no one size fits all family. We all have different needs and we're likely in different stages of having our lives organized and our children's needs. So some of this may apply to you and some may not. And if like me, you're currently way behind and you need it all, then I want you just to take a deep breath and realize that this is an overview. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna give you some resources and thoughts on breaking it all in and down and where to start. So for now, let's just acknowledge that organization is a process, not a product. I'm not going to tell you to rush out and buy anything or take any drastic steps. We want to go over and think about the bigger picture, and then you make a plan. And if you do need to buy anything, then you can incorporate that in those plans, but that's not what this is about. It's about the process. So if you hear me say nothing else today, I want you to hear this. Tackle one doable project at a time. It's really important uh, to recognize that in this day and age, it's very easy to get caught up in what I call the Pinteresty world of perfection and get deterred and frustrated by the scale of what's presented. It's really important to remember that everyone's situations, expectations, and priorities are different. And honestly, if it's possible, it is po probably possible that I could make my closet look like something out of a catalog, maybe, but that would last about 10 seconds. So we're talking about making meaningful change for you and your family. So think about how you spend your time and what causes you the most frustration? And then make a list. Do you spend too much time looking for misplaced items, cleaning up clutter, too much time at the grocery store? Do you often you know, miss appointments or not know what's going on from day to day? Once you have a sense of what's going to make a difference, then you can make the plan to address it. So I think it's pretty funny that we all set these standards for ourselves that are so high, but it's really important to be honest with yourself about what's going to make a difference for you. So having a perfect entrance might make you feel better, and that might make your life different, feel different. Knowing where your keys are all the time probably will make your life different. So really think about what's meaningful for you. So where do you start? I think you can start with um, making a list having a list that will uh, break down the categories that need your attention. This is just an example. Yours might be different and you may have others to add, but it's a good basic list to start thinking about. Generally, it's a good idea to start with your home as that's going to help set the stage for you to be successful. Once your space is organized, it's easier to move on from there and it will help in the other categories. We've also saved what is typically the most complex thing to organize for last, allowing you to kind of set some habits and get in the swing of things. So let's start with home. How can you make sure your home is working with you and not against you? Well, where can you start with getting organized? You know, and I don't mean work against you like, you know, Amityville Horror kind of house, but if you're constantly looking for things, if nothing has a place, it's gonna make your life a lot harder. So let's start first with 
um, something that we've all heard before, but it really does matter. Your family's wants and needs are going to change, and with that, your wants and needs for the stuff changes. Kids outgrow their clothes, they get tired of their toys, or toys break, and don't even get me started on books. There's a lot of ways to approach this. If you haven't touched it in a year, it goes out, or hold it, and if it brings you joy, keep it. Everyone gets to keep a certain number of items. There's a lot of different philosophies out there. So think about what works for you and your family, and it's fine, but pick one and stick with it. Create a central home binder or file. And you're going to hear me throughout today talk a lot about different types of files and storage. And a lot of that depends. Are you a paper person or an electronic person? I think the truth is where we are right now, most of us are a little bit of both. We all have documents and things that come physically that we need to keep. We might keep a lot on our computer. So I'll try to keep that balance between what you're physically keeping um, versus what you're keeping in your computer or in the cloud. But when I'm saying keep something, think about how that applies to your situation. Um, I'm really fond of binders, physical binders that you can find, and that's just because my directory of my computer is a mess, but if you have a binder, it's right there, you can go to it. But if I say binder and you're more technological, think about that file or that folder on your computer. But create that central home binder, and most people, um, like I said, we'll need both, but keep the information there on, on your home. Instructions for appliances, your home warranties, your home insurance, contact information for your maintenance and service companies, utility information, things like that. If you have it all in one place when you need it, which is typically in an emergency, you'll have it. Keep a home inventory. A home inventory is really simply a list of the, your personal possessions along with maybe their estimated financial value. You can do this the old-fashioned way by just writing everything down in a notebook and starting to keep your receipts in a folder. You can also take advantage of technology. There's lots of apps or use your digital camera or even your phone camera to make a record. We've had several families that we work with tell us over the last few years how grateful for they were that they had this. Families who lived in Houston and their homes were flooded or families who've had homes damaged in fires are really grateful when they have this resource when they need it. A home inventory can help you make sure you have the right kind of and enough insurance to cover your home or possessions. It can help you file and substantiate insurance claims if you ever do have a loss, and it can document financial losses on your taxes when, or when you're seeking assistance. There are several apps out there that can help you, like Know Your Stuff, uh, Belongings, Visual Inventory, Nest Egg, there's lots of more. Just go to the App Store and you can see that there's lots of choices. Um, but find one that works for you and keep that inventory. And once you have it, it's easy to keep up to date. When you buy something new or get something new, you just add it on. Create and maintain a check maintenance checklist. So if you keep this on your phone, on a computer, in a binder, go old-fashioned and hang a list on the refrigerator. I'm a big fan of those. Again, there are even apps like Upkeep Tasks or Home Care Reminder. List out scheduled maintenance items, you know, those routine maintenance tasks like winterizing if you live in a climate that requires that, draining your hot water heater, routine maintenance, things like that. If annual inspections, if you keep that ongoing list and then add to it as you go through, um, and as things come up, you'll be in better shape. Walk through your house and make a to-do list, even kind of that dream to-do list, those cabinets that are loose, that drawer that's stuck, the closet door that squeaks, rooms that need painted. Whatever it is, list it and then prioritize it. That's going to help you keep the big picture of what you want and what needs to be done as you move forward. Designated inbox area. And this really applies to pretty much every section we're going to talk to about today. But pick one spot where the mail gets placed when you come in, where notes from school get placed when they come in, where, you know, things that come from neighbors, anything that comes in, have it all go to one place and then make it a routine to go through it daily. I go through my mail before I ever put it in the mailbox to pull out the, what seems to be ever increasing volume of junk mail that comes in. Um, when my kids hit high school or my two older kids hit high school and started getting information from other programs, I made them their own inbox and that went in the room and that mail went there. So keep it uh, moving, keep it where it goes, check that spot frequently, throw out what isn't needed, deal and delegate with the things that require action, file the things that don't. Hang a, what I call a we need board somewhere in your house that's accessible by everybody. So this is really just a list of what people in your family need. If someone uses the last of the shampoo in the shower, then it's their job to write it on the board. If someone needs a poster board for school, they write it on the board. If someone's out of toothpaste, they write it on the board. It's a great way to communicate and stay on the same page and the basis of writing out your shopping and grocery lists. Think about where everything in your house goes. 
If you have medication all over the house, a little in the kitchen cabinet, some in the medicine cabinet, in the bathroom, some in a drawer in your bedroom, and so on, when you need something, you have to look in the multiple, multiple places to find it. Spend some time thinking about where you have your things stored and think about what's going to be the most efficient. You know, even down to think about where things are in your cabinet. If it makes sense as you unload your dishwasher or dry your dishes where they go, is it a handy place or do you have to walk across the kitchen every time? Think about those little steps because that little bit of time you save does add up. And most importantly, and I'm going to repeat this today, schedule time for organization and get your family on board. Can you schedule an hour on Saturday afternoon to go through your child's dresser? Maybe plan something fun afterwards to motivate everybody to get involved and help you. But if you schedule it, it's far more likely to get done. So let's talk briefly about your cars. Maybe that's a section on your list. What can you do? Some of us spend a lot of time in our cars, especially if we're driving our kids to school or appointments and playdates and the like. Keeping your car clean and organized with kids may feel like trying to nail jello to the wall, but there are some things you can do to make it easier. So first, just like a house, gather up all your important documents related to your car and keep them in one place. You'll want to keep your registration and insurance information in your glove compartment, but you can keep, it, keep a copy of that in your car binder, along with copies of your titles, maintenance agreements and records, registration renewal copies, things like that. That way, when you need them, you can know where they are. Just like your house, make a maintenance checklist. Uh, keep a list of scheduled routine maintenance, but also make a list of things you know you may need to get checked out. This can help because I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I show up at the mechanic, those little things I forget. You know, something squeaking. I noticed something the other day. If I keep that list, I'm far more likely to communicate that and get it fixed. Keep a trash bag in your car and maybe a going in bag so that you kind of keep that volume of things that accumulate on the floor out of the way. If you have kids, you know this is a most. You know, those half-eaten snacks, tissues, broken toys, sticks collected at the park, they accumulate, so have a place to put them. Look up online, and you'll find many hacks to keep your car clean. You know, keep a shoe rack over the back of your seat for your kids' toys and plastic bags to clean up messes. Put little, you know, silicone cupcake liners in your cup holders to keep them clean, things like that. And again, just like your house, schedule time to clean and organize your car, even if it's just the three minutes it takes when you fill up your car with gas. So work is on there. Um, if For those of you who work, whether that's your job or volunteering, you're running your household, this does impact your family organization. And again, this is going to be different for all of us. But ask yourself, you know, do you have a home office? Can you designate a separate workspace that is only for work? If you don't have that kind of space, do pick one spot to store your work materials so that you always know where they are. Keep them separate from your family business. So if you run a business from home, have separate filing areas. Uh, for your work and your business, um, for your personal papers and your work papers. Have separate inboxes for your work and personal email. If you work away from your home, but you often bring work home, consider that when you're organizing a homework space. I have one bag. Well, it's really more like a file cabinet with a strap, but I have this one bag that I keep everything I need to go back and forth from the home and office with me, and I'm careful to always return anything I take out. That's why I don't end up getting to work and needing something that I've left at home. And that giant bag goes next door to the door every night just so I know when I'm walking out the door, I know where it is. I can grab it on my way. And think about contingency plans. If you work from home, think through scenarios that could present a challenge ahead of time. Look up remote workspaces you could use in the event that you have a power or internet outage. Have a list of your helpful resources made up, your IT help desk or company, your phone service numbers, relevant account numbers, emergency babysitters, and the like. Planning ahead can make those stressful situations a little bit more bearable. So this is a really big one, and we're going to kind of talk about this in two parts today. Uh, I want to briefly go over it right now, but a little bit later we're going to discuss the Palm Book. This is a vital resource for parents, particularly those who have children with complex needs. It's a critical tool in organizing your school, health, and caregiver data. But we'll go into that a little deeper, but I just want to briefly talk a little bit about what you can do here. Have an insurance notebook where you file all of your policy documents, explanation of benefit forms, claim forms, communication logs. Anybody who has insurance and has ever had a health issue knows how critical this can be. And sometimes the difference in getting a claim covered versus not comes down to your record keeping. If you want more information on this, I suggest you watch our webinar, A Parent's Guide to Navigating Insurance Coverage. You can find it on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the Johnson Center. We talked about this briefly before, but store your medication and supplements in one place. And if there's someone in your family who takes more than a few medications or supplements, consider keeping a medication and supplement log to, um, there when you stored with it. 
This is going to come in handy when it's time to reorder or you need to go to the doctor. We'll have more on this when we talk about the palm book later and some examples. Also, if you have someone in your family who does take more than a couple of pills a day, consider using pill organizers. You can sit down one night per week and organize the pills for the entire week, making sure you have easy access and that the person taking them has everything they need. And this is really helpful when you're traveling or when a new caregiver may need to step in to have everything organized all in one place is a big help. And there's a thousand different kinds out there. You can just look on Amazon for pill organizers. There's daily ones, weekly ones, even some by the month. There's some you can buy that you can make your own little sealed plastic pouches. So if you're taking them with you. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. Organize all your supplemental insurance records in one place. So by this, I mean your dental, vision, disability, life insurance, anything similar. Having all those po policy documents in one place makes them easy to find, easy to use, and accessible to your loved ones should they ever need it. So part of that is long-term planning. And I just want to briefly touch on this because there's some really great resources out there to help families with long-term planning, which becomes even more important when we have children with significant challenges and as we as parents get older. One great resource I want to share with you is a nonprofit called GYST.org. That stands for Get Your Stuff Together. It doesn't really stand for stuff. I'm not going to say the word, but you get the gist. This is a site that will walk you through advanced care directives and other planning measures that you need to take to make sure your family is taken care of should you become ill, incapacitated, or worse. They have great resources to make this challenging planning much easier. So if you haven't taken care of all that, I highly recommend you check it out. So school. So this is where we really demonstrate that those kids come with a lot of paper. And kids with more complex needs or challenges come with much, much more paper. And it all has to go somewhere and often it needs to be retrieved. So you need a system. This is not only going to help you with clutter, but it's also going to save you time. Think about how much time you spend looking for certain reports, records. It can also help you figure out how to better advocate for your child or support your child in school. With helpful data at your fingertips, you can have the information you need to back up you or your child's requests. So how, what kind of system can you set up? Again, that's going to be different for every family. It depends on what you have and what you like to use. First, I would say start with designating one inbox and schedule time once a week to review and file school papers. This is especially true if you have a younger child who has an IEP. You're getting an IEP report. Some families get daily reports. Um, so it's really important to have a system to deal with all that coming in. So choose your system. That could be binders. It could be files. It could be electronic files. You want to purge that stuff at least once a year. There are things you're going to want to keep, quarterly reports, IEP meeting records, things like that. You may not want to keep the everyday papers. Um, you might. It really depends on the situation. Some people use those to track data, to track if their child's meeting goals, but decide what you need and make sure you're purging what you don't need at least once per year. Keep your most recent files easily acceptable, accessible sorry, and store the rest. So you might have a monthly folder. You keep it all in one month. Once that month's over, you put it in a file. But keep those because you never know if a teacher is going to call or you're going to have a question and you need to pull that and say, you know, I'm noticing for the last three weeks, Jake hasn't been eating his lunch. I notice he hasn't gotten his smiley face. Whatever that is, you want to keep that information handy. Goes without saying, but needs to be said, back up all your electronic files. Use email folders. We get lots of emails from teachers and coaches and teachers' aides and therapists and principals and vice principals and counselors and speech therapists and all these people from school. So set up folders in your mailbox to store that, whether that's one folder for the school or you break it down by class or however that works for you. But again, doing that, once you get it all done, it's going to make it much easier to manage. And for all kids, they come with lots of keepsake items. There's lots of ways to store those, all that artwork, those reports, um, all that stuff they send. It's easy to get overwhelmed because it will quickly add up. You can look on Pinterest or look online. There's lots of ways people handle it. You might take a picture of all your children's artwork and then gift it to grandparents. You might buy a big folder to store it in year by year, have a box year by year that you keep in your attic, but decide how you're going to deal with it and be consistent in doing so. Really, the most important things here, again, schedule time to organize and stay up to date. We're going to talk a little bit more about the additional information on organizing your school data soon when we get to talking about the Palm Books. So we've thought through our systems, we've made our lists, what can we do to empower ourselves to make our lives easier? The first thing I'm going to tell you 
is start every day with a checklist. Consider making one for your spouse or partner and your children. If you use paper, keep it in a plastic sleeve, keep it in your purse, car, backpack, diaper bag. If you use an electronic list, that's fine on your phone, but make notes on it throughout the day for calendar updates, questions, observations, then use that list to make your next day's list. Consider setting up a family whiteboard or chalkboard where you can write daily communications. My family has a whiteboard. It's hanging in the kitchen. We use it every day to communicate what's going on, what everyone's needs are. It might look like this. Prepare it the night before so that you get everything you need ready to go and out the door. This can be especially important if you have more than one caregiver in your home, a sitter or a therapist, or even communicating with your spouse or partner, knowing what everybody's plan is, what they're going to need, what you need to be doing, and who's doing what goes a long way in making sure everyone's on the same page and things stay organized, up to date, and everybody gets picked up. Then looking beyond that day-to-day, -day, you have to have the family calendar. That's your master plan. This is a very, very, very important piece of the puzzle. What it looks like depends on the needs of your family. Do you need a master calendar that's hanging on the wall? Maybe they're in the kitchen by your uh, whiteboard that's color-coded for each of your family members. Or are you more of an electronically oriented family? There are apps, planners, and many online options. Decide what works best for your family. My family uses Google calendars. I like it because you can view multiple calendars in one place, sync it on my phone. I sync my work schedule, my kids' calendars, and our family calendar, and it's viewable all in one place. Additionally, everyone else in my family can see it, so they can easily check the calendar to see what's going on and add things to it. If you decide to use Google or any other calendar, there's some great tut online tutorials that will teach you how to use it and get the most out of that or any other apps. So really, whether you go print, electronic, or honestly both, the most important things to keep in mind are to do what works for your family. Talk to your partner or spouse or your other caregivers in your home. If your children are old enough and enabled, talk to them and see what works for them. Schedule times to update it. Sit down. For me, it's Sunday night. I sit down and look over the calendar for the coming week, work out any issues that might be coming up, make sure it's up to date, and make a plan. Ensure that the right people have access to the calendar your partner, any sitters, caregivers, think about whether the, they need access and the ability to update it. Add regularly scheduled events as soon as you can. That's where that list comes in handy. If you've got your daily list and you're out and about and things come up and you've made a note, if you're not putting it right into your calendar then, if you look at your list that night to make the next day's to-do list, that gives you the opportunity to update your calendar. And it's really important to book early whenever possible. So I try not to leave a doctor's office, a dentist appointment, a car maintenance, vet appointments, things like that without booking the next appointment. And that way it's in my calendar and I can plan around it. So really it's true that a good calendar can save your sanity. So before we move on to the palm book section that we've been talking about or alluding to, I want to take just a couple minutes to share some tips and tricks that my colleagues here and some of our patients' family members have shared with us over the years in the hopes that it might help you. So really quickly, just a few kitchen time savers, and this is a topic for a whole other webinar, but a few things I want to share are cooking and freezing. You know, Sundays are in my house. I make at least two meals for the week that I cook and freeze that we can just pull out and reheat. And that way on busy nights when things are going on or when I really just don't feel like cooking, I have something prepared. That goes with plan and prep in advance. Do what works for your family. For me, sitting in down again on Sunday, making the list of the week, making my master grocery list, going to the store, I check our we need board, add anything there to it, go and get everything we need, and that way during the week I'm not having to run to the store. I have everything I need. Pre-pack snacks and lunches to the best of your ability, whether that's you buy in bulk and then you package in smaller containers for your kids to grab, or you have things ready to go, veggies cut up, fruit cut up, you know, uh, crackers pre-portioned in baggies, things like that. Have that done, and that'll make your days go a little smoother, particularly if you're rushing to get out the door to school and work. If you have friends or family who may have similar um, dietary needs as your family, whether that's preference or for medical reasons, consider setting up a meal swap. If you know someone, you know, it's almost just as easy to cook twice as much at the same time. Maybe one night you cook twice as much and give to them, the next night they do to you, and that saves you a night of cooking and cleaning. Keep a staples grocery list, kind of those things that you always buy. Maybe have a staples list that you can just circle what you need on it and then add to it anything else you need. 
and then consider buying frequently used items in bulk. So Costco, Sam's, those big stores where you can buy enough for an army. If you use enough of something, that might make sense if you have space to store it. A few other tips that people shared with us. One person made more storage by getting rid of all those DVD and CD boxes. I'm just putting them into sleeves. The person I talked to, which was one of our patients' families, actually gained three tall bookshelves doing this and then had room for all those books. Another parent told us that she makes checklists for herself and her kids to get ready in the evening for the next day. We talked a little bit about the importance of lists. This saves them time getting out the door and backtracking to get forgotten items. Hers was a visual schedule. She had one child who responded well with visual schedules, one who could read, so she would do both. So she'd have a list. They had to complete their list and be ready to go for the next day. Another parent told us that she never leaves an appointment without scheduling the next one. We talked a little bit about that, that making sure that you're setting it and controlling things around it so it's already on the calendar. Another parent mentioned, and this is really important, storing important documents in fireboxes, birth certificates, social security cards, card titles, passports. That way you can grab that firebox in an emergency and you know where everything is. Some people often use a safe dep safety deposit box in banks as well, but it is nice to have it at home where you can easily access it. Phone logs are really important um, for a lot of things, especially when it comes to things like insurance, but you can use one for every day just to keep track of what you're doing, what you've told people. Um, I can't tell you how many times mine has come in handy, both with insurance or with people saying, oh, you didn't call, and I can look back at my phone log and say, well, actually, on January 5th at 3 p.m., we talked and this happened. So it's a nice way to kind of cover yourself and also keep track of what needs to be done. Someone else suggested using auto ship for items they use regularly. Places like Amazon, I believe Target, there's several that have auto ship that if you have things that you do order regularly, whether that's you know household items, laundry detergent, I think even some grocery and Amazon grocery has food. If you know you go through X amount in a month, you can set that up to be delivered every month and they often offer discounts to do that. And a really, really, really good piece of advice is to always, always, always think twice about what you bring into your home. Know that what you're bringing in you really want. This is a great habit to put your kids in rather than accumulating a lot of junk. Um, really having things that mean something to you um, and not just a bunch of clutter can make a big difference in your house. Um, and I know kids who have set up for birthdays rather than gifts that they'll probably never touch, either taking donations or having people bring their favorite book and then they can read it and donate it to the library. So just think about curbing the flow of things that are coming into your house that you have to deal with. So if you have any tips or tricks, I hope you will share them with us so that we can share them with others. And so now I want to get into talking about what we alluded to earlier, the POM book. POM stands for peace of mind. So this is really a way to store your data and your information in a way that is useful and, like the name implies, brings you peace of mind. Um, I have one in my house for 18 years. My oldest is 19. Um, in my house, we call it the bus book, which is not quite a cheery as name. Uh, I called it the bus book because it's the book of everything that people would need should I get hit by a bus. Um, but really, it is the manual of your family, the manual of your life. And so that sounds very daunting. Um, but I do think it's really important to be prepared. And I think being prepared gives you peace of mind and some security and also the ability to quickly get this information when you need it. So what is the Palm Book other than the Peace of Mind Book? Well, like I said, it's the manual of your family. In it, you're going to have important numbers, your daily schedule, school information, medical information, any therapy information, any dietary information, and financial information. And so let's start with looking at those important numbers. What do I mean by storing your important numbers? This is where you're going to do a brain dump on all of the phone numbers, first of all, that anybody in your family could need. So like I said, think of it, if you were suddenly incapacitated, whether that was because you had an emergency in your family and you immediately needed to travel somewhere or an emergency came up at work or something happened, if another caregiver, whether that's your spouse, partner, a babysitter, a neighbor stepped in to help, what numbers could they possibly need? So here's an example. We all know kind of the basics, uh, the emergency numbers, the hospitals, your doctors, your vets. But also think about who are your family members? Who are your extended family members? 
Would your pharmacy, do you have any therapists? Who are the neighbors? Who are the babysitters? Maybe who are your children's friends and their parents' numbers? So think about if you were gone for a month, if you know you got abducted by aliens and you were taken away for a month, what numbers could a caregiver need to keep your household running and put them down on that? When we're talking about numbers, we're also talking about other important numbers they may need. Numbers for your insurance information include a copy of your insurance card, both the front and the back. If you have a separate prescription benefit card, include a copy of that. Do you have pets? Any vet inf information and vet insurance information you have could be included. Copies of any relevant business cards for those therapists. If you have a supervisor, your doctor, anybody that they may need, any copies of those cards would be helpful. And then phone lists for your household numbers. Do you have a home warranty? Who would they call in an emergency for anything like um, any home issues, plumbers, electricians, lawn care, things like that. So just think about in the course of your life, who do you have to contact? Because so often we keep those numbers in our head or in our phone that aren't identified. And if someone else needed them, it'd be a lot harder for them to get access. So the next section we talked about was the daily schedule. So by that, I mean do a brain dump of their day-to-day -day schedule. If you have a child, particularly a child who has complex health needs, this is really important. If an emergency comes up and you've stepped out, keeping your child's schedule consistent is going to be one of the best ways not only to give you peace of mind, but to make the transition best for them and any caregivers. So are their schedules different on weekends or weekdays? You can write that out. What's a typical weekend look like? What are the expectations that a caregiver should know? Are things more flexible on the weekend? Do they get more, you know, screen time on the weekends? And what are the rules for that? What are bedtimes on weekends versus weekdays? Uh, what are the activities that you typically do on the weekends? And what are the things they prefer on the weekdays? You know, what time do they need to get up to be to school on time? How long do you have for meals? How long does it take them to get ready? Are they able to independently dress or do they need support? When you go to therapy, where do they go? How much time is that? Are they expected to engage in the therapy or do they just sit in the waiting room while the child goes in when's free time things like that are really important to communicate to a caregiver and I can tell you that you'll feel a lot better having written this out and I want to take a second there to pause to tell you that if you're sitting there furiously scribbling notes two important things one this presentation will be on our YouTube channel so that you can review it and I'm going to give you some resources at the end and some options for going through this information again if you want a kind of step-by-step to-do list because I know it's a lot some supporting documentations for that schedule information might include copies of any schedules whether that's a school schedule um, therapy schedule things like that directions to the places you've listed. So whether that's for rec recreation, school, therapy, include addresses, and if you need to, directions, parking information, things like that. That may include information or brochures on those preferred activities. So if it's a weekend and your child really likes to go to a particular park or maybe an arcade or someplace specific, including information on those things might help a caregiver to find information. If you have any programs, therapy programs, or support for self-help or daily living skills, um, it's important to put them there so caregivers have access to that information. If your child uses picture schedules, because that's sometimes foreign to new caregivers, it's important to include that information there, what those schedules are, how to use them, and what's appropriate. And then if your child has any particular friends they have playdates with, including that information so that they can contact them and, again, keep the schedule consistent, that would be really helpful. So we've gone through our important numbers. We've gone through our daily schedule. Now we're going to move on to school information. We talked a little bit earlier about organizing our school information at home, but this is also a great place to kind of put up-to-date information. So maybe your first brain dump on this include just where they go to school. Who is their teacher? What's the contact information for the teacher? What time does school run? Do they ride a bus or not? If not, what are the drop-off rules? I know a lot of schools have very strict rules about how drop-off works, so include that there. When is lunch? Do they get lunch at school or do they pack a lunch? If you pack a lunch, include that information there. Do they have any after-school activities? And do this for each of your children so that they have all that information and say when it was last updated. That'll be a good reference for you when you come back to know if it's the most up to date. Some of the supporting information in this section can include a copy of their school schedules, a copy of their report cards. This gives names of teachers. It gives information on the school and it's also handy for you when you need to grab it. 
If you have a tutor or a therapist at school, any relevant tutor information. If your child has an IEP, keep their most current IEP in your palm book. That way it's always easily accessible for you and it's accessible for any caregiver in emergencies. Maps to their school. If a lot of times kids have many teachers. You have art teacher, you have a Spanish teacher, you have a this teacher, that teacher. Have a list of all those teachers so that your caregiver and you have their contact information easily um, accessible. Advocacy, advocacy support information is important to include, particularly if your child does have an IEP. So if there's someone that helps you um, in your uh, ARD meetings, in your IEP meetings, or even just helps you communicate with the school, helps educate you about what your child's rights are, or what you need to be doing as an advocate for your child, include that there. Again, it'll be easily accessible for you when you need it, but also easily accessible to anyone who may possibly need it um, in an emergency. And then these days, most schools have online portals. Um, if you're an AISD, we have Charms and now Blend. I don't know, it's always changing. But um, lots of schools have websites where you log in not only to see your children's um, grades, but also to see information about homework, um, any upcoming events, communication with teacher. So if they do have a website that they utilize, be sure to include the login information there with the school. So you can see now in this notebook, you've already got all of your important numbers, your daily schedules, copies of cards and contacts that you need, your school information, your IEP. So it's a really handy tool, not just for other people, but for you as well. And keeping this up to date can really make a difference when you need to find information. So next we're going to talk about medical information. Again, we talked a little bit earlier about what your overall medical file system might look like, but within your palm book, first you're going to start like we've did with all the other sections and do a brain dump on each of the members of your family. Who are their doctors? When did they last have their last physical or their last appointments? Do they have any allergies? Do they have any dietary allergies or restrictions? Are they on any medication? Do they have any medication allergies? If they have a vaccination schedule or, or vaccination information, keep that. Um, what supplements do they take? Keep a current list, whether she, they take them themselves or they need help if it's a liquid, if they need to be given or if they know where they are. Uh, when do they brush their teeth and when do they take them? You know, kind of that kind of thing. Do that for each of your children. And again, you can say where the additional medical information can be located. So if you keep all your files in a file cabinet, you know, all, you know, their medical chart is in drawer two in the office or in the living room. Um, but this is the summary. So if I had to in an emergency, if I've been stepped into my neighbor's house because they've been called to an emergency, I can look at this and say, okay, I'm not going to feed this child peanuts. If something happens, I know how to call their pediatrician. I know how to answer questions about what medications they're taking. Um, so it's a really useful tool. And it's also something when you're going to the doctor, or you're taking your child to the doctor, you can bring that with you because you're going to have then the most current information. So if you go to the doctor and they say, tell me all the medications that your child's on, you're going to have the list there with you. Well, let's talk a little bit about what that supporting information can look like because that's really helpful um, to use. So in here, you might have a medication or supplement schedule and note or note where the most current one is posted. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. But for some of our kids or some of us, we're on fairly complicated medication or supplement schedules. And it's really important to have that up to date, not just because in an emergency, if I'm going to the emergency room, I want to take that with me so I can show them exactly what it is I'm taking. But I can also take it to my routine appointments to show my doctor to remind them what I'm on to give them up to date information so they make decisions with that full information. Any current treatment notes from any of your providers. So if you or your children are under the care of a doctor for any illness or anything like that, have the most current treatment notes, what you're supposed to be doing. Any doctor's notes for medications or allergies. This is important, particularly if you're going to be traveling um, and you need to take, for example, liquid medication with you on a plane. It can be important to get to schools or camps if your child has to take medication at school or camp. Um, so it's important to keep that information handy. Any payment or insurance information for doctor's visits. So if you know that your child goes, for example, you might see a doctor who has a copay or that you pay at the time of services or the dentist might require payment at the time of service. Have that information there. Here's our insurance card. Here's what I know copays are. Here's, you know, this doctor bills us. This one you have to pay at the time of service. Have that information handy and that's really helpful. 
if you've had any laboratory assessments, you or your child have your most recent copy there. Um, for some of us who have treatment for chronic illnesses or ongoing issues, we might rack up a lot of these lab reports. Having your most recent one handy can really help when it comes time to either go to the doctor or have an emergency to take that in to show what we have. Any vaccination records and or exemptions that you have, keep those there. Again, that comes in handy when you go to the doctor, when you have an emergency, when you're registering for a camp or a school, that's always the documentation you have to provide, so have that handy to provide. Authorization for minors medical treatment. So um, just in case you don't know this, if you're away, um, let's say you go on an overnight trip and you leave a babysitter at home and your child falls and twists their ankle, they're going to have a tough time when they go to the doctor because if they don't have authorization to provide medical care, the doctors are going to need to get that from you. So there is, you can find these online, there are affidavits that you can sign that authorize someone else to authorize medical treatment. And that doesn't mean they can do whatever they want, but it means that if your child breaks their leg and you're not accessible, someone can take them to the doctor and there will be no delay in treatment because they can authorize them to set the leg. Hopefully in communication with you, the doctor would still talk to you, but if you're not there, that gives them the opportunity to provide treatment quickly and not cause any delay. So you might consider keeping some of those affidavits handy. And then any supplement and medication shopping or source list. So if you're, you or your child take medication or supplements, list where you get it um, or where you order it from. Some people order from online pharmacies. Some people go to CVS or Walgreens or their local grocery. Some people order supplements online. Some people go to a local health food store. List where you get them so that if someone needs to replace them in your absence, they can do so easily. So we talked a little bit about medication and supplement schedules. So again, this is useful in your palm book and as a daily reminder or checklist. There are apps you can use. If you look in the app store, there's all kinds of um, things you can download to track medications. You can also just make a Word or Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be complicated depending on your situation. These are really important, important as I mentioned, and useful for clinical appointments to go in and say, here is my most current medication list of what I'm taking. It also provides an ease and accountability. So if you provide, for example, your doctor with a list, this is everything I'm currently taking, and they have that documented, they're then not going to prescribe something that might be contraindicated to something you're already on. So it really makes that communication clear. It helps, again, if you know where you're getting it. It gives you the shopping list. If you know everything you're taking, that's your shopping list. And it also helps you with those pill organizers we talked about um, earlier. If you know everything you're taking, if you have the list, it's really easy to sit down and fill those up. So here's an example. This is just something that was created in Excel. So this is the, my imaginary medication list. It's for a week. Now this is good if things there are changes that you're doing. Let's say you have a child that you're putting on a medication or a supplement schedule and you and your partner or spouse or another caregiver are both responsible. If this is hanging right inside the cabinet where all the medication are stored because we talked about we're going to keep it all in one place now, I have this list hanging there. When I give Joey his medication Monday morning, I'm going to initial that. And that way when my partner comes out and checks, they can say, oh, Joey already had that and they're not going to double dose it. Or if I miss something, I'm going to block that out and say, nope, he didn't take it. Let's say that keeps us on the same communication track. We know who's giving what and when. We know he's gotten it. We're all communicating and everything's great. Now let's say Joey uh, has an asthma attack and we have to rush him to the emergency room. I can grab this off the cabinet. We rush to the emergency room. I hand it to him. They can see everything he's taken in the last few days in one quick minute based on what I've just handed them. So not only does it keep you on the same page, it's great in an emergency. It's great to show your doctor, you know, here's my medication list from the last four weeks. We've taken it all. We're consistent. So it's just a great communication and tracking tool. So like I said, this was created in Excel. If you don't want to download an app or go fancy, it's pretty easy to do. It's good that you can notice there we have not only what and when we take, but what the dosage is as well. You can see here, this is a sample shopping list I made. So you can see in the first column, we have the medication or the supplement that we're taking. We have the dose in the next column, the brand. That can be really important because, as you know, if you've shopped for any uh, supplements in particular, there's lots of different brands, and most clinicians are pretty particular given the lack of regulation of supplements. Um, 
knowing that you're buying a quality brand is important to a lot of clinicians. So be sure and list the brand that you use so that if anybody else is buying it, they're getting the right thing. You can list where you buy it. You know, do you buy it at your doctor's office? Do you order it online? Do you get it at the pharmacy? Um, how to contact, you know, where is that store or where is that website? What's the phone number? Again, that makes it much easier when you have to replace anything. So now in our family manual, our piece of mind book, we've got all the numbers, we've got the schedules, we've got the inform school information, the medical information, and all the documentation to support it. So if you have a child who, or yourself, if you're in any therapies, interventions, um, if your child's getting uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, ABA therapy, play skills therapy, music therapy, whatever it is, you can keep all the information right here. So again, it starts with that brain dump. What is my child doing? If he's getting speech, where is he getting speech? Who's the speech therapist? What's their contact information? When do they go? What's the cancellation policy? What is the person who takes him expected to do when they go? Very important. Does he expect a prize, a sticker at the end, let him know that. That way, again, it's consistent. They're not dragging him out of there and he's panicking because he didn't get his frozen sticker. You know the schedule. You know what the expectation is. Include any quarterly reports or goals or what they're working on. And that way you have all that, again, in one place. Do that for any therapies they're getting. They're getting speech, OT, ABA. Do they have, uh, are they on any state programs that they're getting support? You know, here in Texas, are they in class? Who's their a uh, caseworker for that? Are they getting music therapy or massage therapy or play therapy? Keep all that information and the most up-to-date reports that information in one place and that way it's easier to continue and it's easier for you to find that up-to-date information when needed. It's also really important if you have, for example, if you live in Texas, let's say your child is um, on the class list, there's possible you can have audits where they want information. It's easy to pull that information together if you have the most up-to-date information all in one place. So supporting documentation for this program or this section of our book might include, again, a copy of your current ther therapy reports, including their programs and goals. And not only is this going to help you have it all in one place, but in the event that another caregiver comes in, if there's things they should be working on at home or if they're supposed to be consistent with something, they have that information right there in black and white list of any resources to learn more about those therapies. So again, let's say your mom gets sick and you got to hop on a plane and fly to Wisconsin for a week and dad or even another caregiver steps in or a sitter comes to stay and you're there taking care of mom. You don't have a lot of time to be debriefing. If you've got it all in one place, you don't have to. So if he's doing speech therapy, give him an opportunity to learn a little bit about why he may be doing that. Or if he's doing um, equestrian therapy or equine therapy, why would you do that? Include a little information because it goes a long way to them being consistent and invested in keeping things going in your absence. Any referrals, prescriptions for therapy, include them there. You often need these, whether it's to renew a referral or a prescription, whether it's something has gone wrong or the insurance company asks for it or the school says they need to see it. It often comes up that you need those referrals or prescriptions. Keep them there and keep them in one place. Again, keep payment information for those therapies. If your speech therapist bills your insurance, note that. If they don't, if there's a copay, note that too. If you pay in full, note that. And you may want to include information on, you know, there's an emergency credit card in the first drawer of this or, you know, bank account information is as such, just so things can keep going. If for any reason you don't want to include that financial information for security, at least then they know they can communicate with the provider. Hey, listen, I know they normally pay the $50 copay when we come in. They're, there's an emergency. They're not available. Is that okay? And most providers would, of course, work with you in those situations. And then any assessments. So if you've had a recent assessment or any assessment, keep a the most up-to-date copy there so that they can utilize that. So if someone asks for it, they have it handy or you have it handy. So next in our book is dietary informa information. And this can be as complicated or as simple as your dietary needs may be. So again, that brain dump of each family member. Do they work with a dietitian or nutritionist? Do they have any known food allergies or tolerances? Are they on any medically prescribed diets for any reason? List that there. You can also list food preferences. This is really important with kids. Um, again, in stressful situations, keeping things consistent is important. So if you have a caregiver, 
making a meal they absolutely will not eat, that's going to make it hard on everyone. So if we list these are their favorite foods, this is kind of even their comfort food, this is what we do, this is where we shop, having that information available is going to make it a lot easier for any caregiver to utilize. It's also something that you can share with clinicians when you have appointments. Here's where we are. This is the current status of our diet and our family. This is what they eat, what they don't eat. This is what we're restricting or not restricting. These are their preferences. And that can be really helpful for your pediatrician, your nutritionist, or anybody else who may be working with your child. Supporting documentation in the section could include, again, a short description of whatever dietary plan you might be following. A sample weekly meal plan, and I'll show you an example of that here in just a second, I think. If not, we have several webinars on this subject. Um, if you look on our YouTube channel on making weekly meal plans and what those can look like. Shopping lists. So again, we talked about in that kitchen section kind of keeping a staples list. You might include a couple of copies of your shopping list in this section. So if a caregiver is there, that gives them a sense of the kind of things you need to buy and what they should be stocking. Any notes or recommendations if you do work with anyone um, on your child's feeding or dietary intervention, include those recommendations there. Any resources for information, particularly if your child is, let's say they're on a ketogenic diet for seizures or they have celiac disease, providing information on that will help a caregiver be consistent and informed. It's also helpful just like those old shopping lists, Include a couple of copies of your old grocery store receipts. That's just as good as a shopping list to give someone a sense of the kind of things you're buying and what they should be looking for. Maybe keep a little recipe guide of some favorite recipes or meals. Again, in an emergency, this would be really handy for a caregiver to be able to provide that consistency. And restaurant lists, menus, directions, takeout menus, um, places that you frequently eat and what your children circle, what your children often order can make it really easy in a pinch for someone to feed your family. So next in our palm book, we're going to talk about financial information you want to include. So of course, we first have our brain dump when it was updated. So here is our bank account. Here is where we keep our checkbook. Here's where we keep credit card information or credit cards. Here's how people are paid. These are where the bills are. Um, this is what everybody charges us. So again, that's going to help someone step in and keep things going smoothly and keep yourself organized. Supporting documentation here will include bank account information, uh, will location. Again, earlier we talked about that website, gyst.org. Hopefully once you go through that, you have a will. Um, it's important to list where that's kept so that people can find it. If you have a financial advisor, include that information. Uh, a copy of your family budget. Again, this is more for you and your partner or spouse, but it's a way to keep it up to date and include that information. A list of what your therapy costs are. This would be really helpful not only for a caregiver stepping in, but in conversations with your insurance company when it comes time to do your taxes to remind you of things that you've paid out of pocket for. Because as we know, and as you can learn about in some of our other webinars, you know, traveling to and from therapy appointments may or may not be tax deductible. But keeping kind of those triggers to make you think about that is another way to stay on top of things. Copies of any of your insurance policies. So um, if you have life insurance, again, you can either just make a list that you have it here and note where it's kept or keep a copy of it. A copy of your insurance cards, things like that. And any instructions or passwords. I wouldn't encourage you to list your passwords out for anyone to see, but there are password keepers um, and apps that you can use that not only help you track them, but in the event that something happens, your partner, spouse, or designated person will have access to them to, again, keep things going. So if you look in the app store or password keeper or password lockers, um, there are also, you know, lock notebooks you can get that you keep in a firebox that you would note here. Information is located in the firebox. So again, just have a system for when something happens that you know you have access to that information for yourself or for any caregiver who might need to step in. So some things to remember on your palm book are to start somewhere. You know, do you want, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can tackle this, but even if it's just one section a week, one section a month, whatever it takes to help you make progress, depending on the volume and size of your family and how much information will depend on how long that might take, but you have to start somewhere. Pull it out and review it once a month and keep it up to date. A lot of that information is static and won't frequently change, but at the beginning of the school year is a good day to up time to update it because your teachers will change, your school information will change. Um, at the end of the year, update it so that you know anything changing then. 
pick points that you can go and look through it to keep it up to date and keep yourself organized. Always keep it in the same place. If it's on the bookshelf in the kitchen or uh, under my bed or wherever that is, keep it in the same place. Make sure your partner or other caregivers know, and you can also refer to it. If you're running out the door, hey, the book is there. So that goes to that, let important people know where it's kept. Whoever you would call on in an emergency, they need to know where it's kept. And as your child gets older, you can involve them in the process to the extent of their ability. It's a good way to teach your kids to keep their own information um, organized. So have them help make the school list or maybe write down their daily schedule. You might learn a lot in doing that. I know I have. How your kids see their daily schedule and how you see their schedule may be really different. And so when you're making that for a caregiver, it might be really good to get their perspective on that. That doesn't mean they get to say what it is, but it's a good way to incorporate them in the process. And then back up that information, but keep a physical copy. Again, this needs to be really accessible to someone in an emergency. So if it's on your laptop under a password that you're going to run out the door with in an emergency, that's not going to help anybody. So this is something that you really need to keep a physical copy. Um, I know one family that we worked with that keeps an iPad in their kitchen and they keep it on there. I know several families that keep a notebook in the kitchen. Whatever works for you, um, find it, but make sure it's something that is left in the house that someone can access in the event of an emergency. So who feels overwhelmed? Um, I do, and I wrote it. So um, these are all things I've done over the years, but they're not always necessarily things I'm great about keeping up with, particularly in times get busy or stressed. So I want you to know that we're in this together. So if you do want some extra support, if we've flown through this and you're thinking, I wouldn't even know where to begin, then email me at this email address, info at johnson-center.org, and if you do, I'll sign you up to receive a bi-weekly email from me that's going to have one task outlined to complete. Some weeks you might already have that done and you're going to feel smug and relaxed in the knowledge that you're ahead. Some of the weeks the tasks are going to be really easy and you can cross it off your to-do list quickly. And that's always a really nice, satisfying feeling. It's one of my favorite things, crossing off things on lists. Some weeks it might be a little more daunting. It might be that chore that you've been dreading, but that you know you need to get done. And then we'll do it together. Uh, so shoot me an email and we'll take that first step together. And hopefully by the end of the spring, we'll all be completely organized and we can be smug in our Pinterest tree worthy lives of how organized we are. Um, if you have any questions, again, I hope you will email us again at that info at johnson-center.org. If you have suggestions or tips that we should share with other families, I hope you'll feel comfortable sharing those too. But I want you to know I'm not saying this is easy. This is not easy for me. I'm behind. I used to be really good at this. And in the last year, I've gotten really behind. So I'm taking this journey with you together. And we're going to get organized. And we're going to feel a lot better for it. Because we're going to know where things are. We're going to know in an emergency things are taken care of. And we're going to be able to use all that information to help advocate and support our children and our family. So I can't say enough that it always starts with the list. Lists are incredibly important in whatever form that it helps you. Notes on your phone, notes on your computer, notes on the back of an envelope that was the phone bill. Whatever it takes, make those lists. It really does just take the first step in getting things started. And that's how you get over the hump and where you want to be. So it's really important um, to encourage your family to be included in this process, whether that's, again, your partner, your spouse, your children, your co-caregivers, whoever's involved, ask them to get involved and help you because it's really important for them. It helps them build skills and it's really important for you. That's how we're all going to become master cat herders. That's how we're all going to get to the place where we want to be. I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or suggestions, or again, if you want to receive that weekly email um, and keep things going and kind of have some accountability and format for how you're going to go through all this, please just shoot me an email. I'm happy to include you. I'll keep you accountable. You can keep me accountable and we'll all get there together. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope you all have a wonderful day.